Torso, you are going down yes. the torso now to the legs. Mm -hmm. She is yes. sitting. Yes. Right? Yes. Now look sitting. what is she sitting on. You can walk around it, right? She is sitting on some sort of a bench. Can you feel the texture of the skirt? He's given her a skirt that's like a shell or a leaf, so that it starts out as a skirt and becomes a natural form. Is it in bronze? It's in bronze. Now, he likes to use natural things, stones, I like the shells, and slips. So when he makes a figure, it could be a piece of landscape. It could be like a rock. It could be like a shell. It, it could like be a like a mount it could be a mountain. He likes to combine the human figure and the landscape. Two heads. I think nothing can be absolutely uh, solved. I don't know a, a really great or good work of art that hasn't got mystery, some mystery in it. The words of Henry Moore. By touching, the blind help us see. By feeling, they help us understand the mystery of Henry Moore. the senses. Painting and sculpture on your eyes. If you were blind, you couldn't be a painter or a sculptor. Uh, music on your ears. If you were deaf from birth, you couldn't be a musician. And so on. And ever since I was young, I liked drawing. I liked drawing from nature. I liked, uh, that is, I liked looking and trying to understand it, trying to uh, uh, reproduce it. And that's that. It's just a natural. There are some people who like uh, writing or like words to, more than any other thing, and that they become writers or poets. Clues to the mystery are found in his words. Henry Moore has written. The observation of nature is part of an artist's life. It enlarges his form knowledge, keeps him fresh and from working only by formula, and feeds inspiration. The human figure is what interests me most deeply, but I have found principles of form and rhythm from the study of natural objects, such as pebbles, rocks, bones, trees, plants. Pebbles and rocks show nature's way of working stone. Rocks show the hacked, hewn treatment of stone. Bones have a marvelous structural strength and hard tenseness of form. Trees, tree trunks, show principles of growth and strength of joints with easy passing of one section into the next. They give the ideal for wood sculpture, upward twisting movement. Shells show nature's hard but hollow form metal sculpture, for instance, and have a wonderful completeness of single shape. There is, in nature, a limitless variety of shapes and rhythms.
Henry Moore's work, The Archer, has found a home in Toronto. He says, the artist works with a concentration of his whole personality, and the conscious part of it resolves conflicts, organizes memories, and prevents him from trying to walk in two directions at the same time. My sculpture is becoming less representational, less an outward visual copy, and so what some people would call more abstract, but only because I believe that in this way, I can present the human psychological content of my work with the greatest directness and intensity. Henry Moore believes his sculpture in open places must be alive, to be caressed and touched. For children, a place to play, to hide and slide. At the Art Gallery of Ontario, the largest collection of Henry Moore sculptures and drawings anywhere. There are some 125 sculptures and 75 drawings, gifts from Henry Moore. He helped design this pavilion himself. These are shapes of our time, reclining figures, alert, awaiting visitors of the world. He is a tireless worker, constantly molding forms and ideas. Okay, so well, we could, uh, yeah. I think that block ought to be just another... Slightly wider. There's too much overlap of the figure, really, isn't yes, there? Yes. Um, so, especially on that side. Mm. I think we could put a good inch, put, put on, a good inch on, on the side. left. Okay, yeah. that's quite I would. easy enough. Okay, good. Okay, and uh, if you come down... very nice figure. Yeah. 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 Yes. You let me know when you think you've made the yeah, Well, I'm just finishing the baby. Want. I should be finished today. Yeah. All right. And, uh, and tomorrow I will start. Start the art with it, yeah. In his time, he has been the most famous sculptor on earth. Each work a variation on the enduring themes of life. Still working with assistants, there are new works. A new finished form at St. Paul's in London. A Madonna and Child. Henry Moore's words. You must concede that a sculpture can possess more than one meaning. The artist has no need to take a literary theme to substantiate his delight in humanity. He can make his point, reveal his love for his fellows just by suggesting. If you see a friend in the distance, you don't recognize him by the color of his eyes, because these you're unable to see, but by the total effect made by his figure, the general disposition of the forms. Henry Moore remembers. 
Wherever you are, there's nature. In the chap's body, in his girls, in the sky, in the weather. Perhaps the industrial north, which is all sudden grime and slums, helps because it means that you love going for walks. Within a mile of where I grew up, there were five coal mines, two chemical works, three coke ovens, and several potteries. In my youth, I went walking outside the town with friends who were the sons of farmers, and I helped in the harvest. It gave me contrast, and that was the value. It's like artists not having a thing too easy. The subject is all of nature, all of life. I've always loved landscape. I can never read in a train. I have to look out the window. Of course, the distance in landscapes are completely different from the distances in an interior, but when you're drawing, it's fundamentally the same problem, hand to ear, tree to mountain, it's all one. He still lives with his wife not far from London. The address, Perry Green, Much Haddam, Dane Tree House. The collection of a lifetime. Just uh, looking around the room here, you seem to be surrounded by beautiful works of art. What, what are the most important items in the room for you. Well, you see, um, we've been collecting. Uh, my wife also is a, a, a born collector. Um, she had a marvelous stamp collection and so on, that kind of fun. And uh, um, there came a time when uh, I could afford to, uh, uh, to buy a, a bit of Negro sculpture or whatever it might be like and then um, and it seemed to me to be sensible to have things uh, around you that you liked yes. and lived with um, and gradually we've acquired um, through the last 30 or 40 years when one began to sell enough work to uh, to do so and uh, I can't now imagine a house without all those things. I mean, this room uh, has got in it uh, things that I never end interest in looking at. Is there I mean, any... There's a, a, a Kobe beyond there on the wall of a nude uh, about off by there. Uh, the figures in this little glass case which is a gothic little group of goth and so on. I, I love them. And uh, it would be funny if one didn't uh, uh, have around you uh, any, anything but your own work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, Do you have a favorite amongst these things in the room? Or just no, saying? but I, I have uh, favorites, yes, but no, no one favorite, no always the emphasis on mystery, his words. For me, life drawing has been a continual struggle to understand the complete three-dimensional form of the model and to express it on the flat surface of the paper. People so often think that in drawing, one uses only one's intellect and intelligence, leaving out emotion and sympathy. This is not so, because one cannot observe clearly without understanding and feeling. Mystery plays a large and enlivening part in our lives. Not knowing, but wanting to know, wondering and guessing, questioning and exploring. We are perpetually intrigued and fascinated by the unknown. When was it that you were first aware that you had this desire to, to capture these oh, things? Right from the beginning, as far as I know. I mean, look, I, I have a, a grandson. Uh, Gus, his name is Guston. And uh, my daughter, his mother, lived uh, next door here. And the first two or three years of his life, I saw him every day because I loved, uh, I loved children. 
and uh, he began to like drawing and he's gone on liking it and I think a lot of people uh, might develop a particular sense if somebody encouraged them if somebody was uh, gave them a um, uh, an example or a start. Uh, did your mother encourage you when you were a no, child? No, I don't know that, they, that she did. No. Um, I had an older brother who did, who was quite uh, gifted and clever with, with uh, drawing. Though I never made any any use of it. The bonny pit laddie, the canny pit laddie, the bonny pit laddie for me, oh. He sits on his cracket as black as his jacket and brings my siller to me, oh. He walks hard. His mother. He was the seventh of eight children. He takes us in his His father a miner in the dusty shadow of the mines. He was born July 30th, 1898, in Castleford, Yorkshire. His birthplace, still a vivid memory. He recalls the beginning. These are Henry Moore's words. I think I was probably about 11 when I first decided I wanted to be a sculptor. I remember quite clearly the instant. As a boy at school, I liked the art lessons. I liked drawing. I used to get my elder brother to draw horses and other things for me from as early as I can remember. But the little incident that clinches the thing in my mind was that our parents used to send me and my younger sister to Sunday school on Sunday afternoons to get rid of us, I think, quite mainly. And the Sunday school we went to was a Congregationalist chapel, although we were Church of England. The superintendent every Sunday used to give a talk which also had some little moral. And one Sunday, he told us about Michelangelo carving the head of an old fawn in the streets of Florence, and that a passerby stood watching Michelangelo carving this head. And after watching two or three minutes, he said to Michelangelo, but an old fawn wouldn't have all its teeth in. Michelangelo immediately, said the superintendent, took his chisel, knocked out two of the teeth, and there, he said, was a great man listening to the advice of other people, even though he didn't know them. Now, this story didn't stick in my mind for its moral, but merely that there was someone, Michelangelo, a great sculptor. Many years later, will emerge Henry Moore's Madonna and Child in a church in Northampton. His mother's image haunts him. She becomes an early sketch preserved on a newspaper of the day.
many interviews talk about how you used to rub your mother's back and yes. got this feeling yes. of texture and yes. so on. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. My mother suffered from rheumatism. And quite often, when I was still a young uh, boy, she'd say, Henry, lad, because Yorkshire, it is often a lad is used as a, instead of Henry boy. Henry, lad, my back does hurt me. Will you rub it? And she had, she'd invented or made some rubbing oils, which were very strong, and which um, I'd sprinkle onto my hand or onto her back and massage her back for her. And this, I'm sure, made me like backs and, and understand backs very much. Often people don't, but I find that backs are, uh, uh, are beautiful. Although they don't have a lot of uh, incident on them, like, like the front of a figure. I vividly remember the pleasure I felt when I first used a hammer and chisel. I was 16 at the time and made a little war memorial, a roll of honor for the grammar school I was at. The first schoolboy carvings are still there. I recall in one of the interviews you talked about noticing the girls in school when you were a young yes, of man. Of course I did. And, and even you could recognize them by their knees, yes, I think. Yes, I could, yes, or, or uh, from their legs downwards, yes. Because uh, the school I went to was a grammar school, mixed grammar school. It was the blue, red, white, and blue in the, the, the boys. And the girls was mixed grammar school. With Brontes, Nightingales, uh, about four, uh, there were four uh, famous women. And uh, on the morning prayers at the beginning of school, uh, whatever time it was, nine o'clock or nine fifteen, we all stood in the in the school hall, which was a big room, about four, six times as big as this. In, in the house rows. So the, the uh, Brontes, all the girls in the Bronte house would all be in the same line. All the girls in the um, Nightingale house would all be in another line. And the same with the boys. Now, I was very lucky in being in the Blue House because I had the girls right in front of me, and not boys. And I could have told you every girl in that school if you showed me them only from the leg downwards. For there's a little spot in England Up in the Yorkshire and Dale so high Where we must the good king stand It's saying we'll conquer or we'll die As a young soldier in France, Henry Moore will be gassed An ailment that still bothers him today Cause I got the good king shilling And I'm off tomorrow morning His first pottery works are extremely traditional, but he is moved by many themes. These are his words. I was very glad I didn't go to an art school till I was 21. Art schools then, and especially in the provinces, had a terribly closed academic outlook. My aim and work is to combine as intensely as possible the abstract principles of sculpture along with the realization of my idea. All art is an abstraction to some degree. Abstract qualities of design are essential to the value of a work. If both abstract and human elements are welded together in a work, it must have a fuller, deeper meaning. The understanding of three-dimensional form is never-ending, and you can separate it into experiments. Space, interior, and exterior form, pressure from within. They're all one and the same big problem. But making holes through a block, you can relate the front to the back and so on. All these things are part of one's interest in understanding three-dimensional reality.
They're all mixed up with the human thing, with one's own body and how one thinks about everything. This talk of representational and non-representational art, spatial and non-spatial sculpture is all nonsense. There's no cutting it up into separate compartments. It's all one. I have looked at the nude for half my life. Our own bodies, our own makeup, have the greatest influence on art. If we were able to sleep on all fours or were the size of an elephant, for example, our architecture would be entirely different from what it is. And so would our art. We know from our hands what things are much better than we would if we had hooves. From our bodies, we understand nature. We can't get away from it. And if the landscape were different, so would our lives be. So the first influence on me came from studying and trying to understand the human figure. London would change his life. For the first year in London, I was in a dream of excitement. When I rode on the open top of a bus, I felt that I was traveling in heaven almost, and that the bus was floating in the air. I went to the British Museum on Wednesday and Sunday afternoons and saw what I wanted to see. One room after another in the British Museum took my enthusiasm. The Royal College of Art meant nothing in comparison. But not till after three months did things begin to settle into any pattern of reality for me. All art has its roots in the primitive, or else it becomes decadent. the art of ancient Mexico that spoke to me most, except perhaps Romanesque and early Norman. And I admit clearly and frankly that early Mexican art formed my views of carving as much as anything I could do. Mexican sculpture, as soon as I found it, seemed to me true and right, perhaps because I had once hit on similarities in it with some 11th century carvings I'd seen as a boy in Yorkshire churches. It's stoniness, by which I mean it's truth to material, it's tremendous power, make it unsurpassed, in my opinion, by any other period of stone sculpture. To me, carving direct became a religion, and I have practiced it during my career as a sculptor. I like the fact that I can begin with the block and have to find the sculpture that's inside it. You have to overcome the resistance of the material by sheer determination and hard work. However, although I used to think that a work carved in stone or wood, carved in solid material, was ipso facto better than a model work, it isn't, of course. It's the quality of the idea and the mind behind it that are important whether they are something sensitive and original rather than hackneyed. I mean they are both a form, both a sculpture. You talk so glowingly about Cezanne's bathing composition, nudes and perspective. You said lying on the ground as if sliced out of mountain rock. What artist have you admired? If one had to, as a game, name 10, uh, the 10 greatest, 10 artists that you think are the greatest, um, I've often tried to do it in my own mind or with, uh, with friends and so yes. on. And there's no doubt that Michelangelo comes in. <laughs> There's no doubt that Giotto comes in. There's no doubt that Rembrandt comes in. And so on. Uh, I mean, I find Turner one of our greatest and best uh, English artists, easily. And I will put Cezanne in. Yeah. Uh, some people might not. He may be too new for them. Maybe too, uh, uh, what, 
or too modern, or whatever you like to call it. Modern is a horrible word, but that's, uh, yeah. What is it about his work, for instance, about what? Cezanne that, that struck well, Cezanne you? Cezanne looked at nature again and yeah. made other people see nature in a different way from what anyone had seen it before. And this is what artists are for, is to open other pe their own eyes and other people's eyes so that you get an excitement and a pleasure and an interest out of your, your eyes, out of the visual world, as much as, um, uh, or more than, uh, any other sense. I've often found that by taking formal ideas from landscape and putting them into my sculpture, I have, as it were, related a human figure to a mountain. I think that is true of the past, too, and that all good art demands an effort from the observer, and he should demand that it extends his experience of life. I think I am a sculptor and not a painter because I want something absolutely realized from all points of view, as I want to make it something which exists like myself or like a table or like a horse. That is the real satisfaction in making sculpture. It may be that a sculptor has that kind of nature. He wants to make a piece of reality, wants to make an actual thing. I, like, I want to understand and appreciate. I wonder whether uh, growing up around the moors had a particular kind of effect, well, the kind of landscape. Yes, well, yes, your, your, your uh, surroundings, of course, influence everybody. Of course it is. And, and you, I, you can't imagine a world that's not this world. Not really, I'd say. <laughs> at what point does the... Uh, looking at nature combined with the imagination. I mean, how much of it is the imagination? How much of it is what you oh, actually see? Oh, nobody knows. You've got to have both. I mean, you've got to relate something when you look at it to something else. And that may mean uh, imagination, or it may be just, uh, I don't know. The mist and mysticism of the Moors profoundly affects other artists of the area, reflected in the poetic works of Emily Bronte. No coward soul is mine, no trembler in the world's storm-troubled sphere. I see heaven's glory shine, and faith shines equal, arming me from fear. 
O oh God, within my breast, almighty, ever-present deity, life that in me has rest as I, undying life, have power in thee. Vain are the thousand creeds that move men's hearts, unutterably vain, worthless as withered weeds or idlest froth amid the boundless main. To waken doubt in one holding so fast by thine infinity, so surely anchored on the steadfast rock of immortality. With wide embracing love, thy spirit animates eternal years, pervades and broods above, changes, sustains, dissolves, creates, and rears. Though earth and man were gone, and suns and universes ceased to be, and thou wert left alone, every existence would exist in thee. There is not room for death, nor atom that his might could render void. Thou, thou art being and breath, and what thou art may never be destroyed. Well, th there's this phrase that uh, John Russell, the critic, used saying that the, 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 the magnificence of your work is that the human being is used as a, a metaphor for nature. Yeah. And I, I wonder if you could explain exactly what that is. I don't know if he used that <laughs> phrase. I can't explain John, <laughs> uh, John Russell. But I suppose he means, I don't know. What do you think he means? Well, uh, a I... Metaphor. A metaphor. A metaphor is what? The same as, know. the same as. He said, it's a metaphor for landscape. I mean, is, are the figures meant to be a kind of landscape? No, but I, I relate, or try to relate. Uh, uh, I, everything together. Yes. I think life is, is life. And it's all related to the human being and to uh, trees are important. The grass is important, the flatness of what water is important, all those things. It's all nature, yeah. It's trying to understand, uh, 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 yes, nature, the world. It's trying to understand our, you see, animals, I don't think, bother about that. We've got a cat, but you don't see this cat looking out in there and being uh, uh, concerned, concerned with the landscape. This has been said about his neighbors, the sheep, by Sir Kenneth Clark. To some extent, Henry Moore's concentration on sheep is accidental. In the country, he lives surrounded by fields full of sheep. They confront him as he goes to his work. They are the first living things he sees in the day. Although he has done many great drawings that appeared to be abstractions, in fact, almost all of them have been inspired by a direct visual impression. His sense of form needs continual nourishment from experience. During the greater part of the year, when he's in his home in Hertfordshire, sheep have provided his most frequent visual experience. He walks down to his studios in the morning. There are the sheep to greet him. For two hours, he hammers away at some huge stone reclining figure and then goes out for a cup of coffee. And there are the sheep still looking at him. No wonder they became a visual obsession. And these are Henry Moore's own words. All artists have some subjects that excite them more than others. And the sheep became one of those obsessive subjects. If every man were made to draw his wife, you might have a few divorces come about, but the husband would start to look more intensely at his wife, and he would know much more about her. He might make a very bad drawing, but that wouldn't be the point. I've always liked sheep, and there is one big sculpture of mine that I call the sheep piece because I placed it in the field and the sheep enjoyed it, and the lambs played around it. Sheep are just the right size for the kind of landscape setting that I like for my sculptures. A horse or cow would reduce the sense of monumentality. Perhaps the sheep belong also to the landscape of my boyhood in Yorkshire. If the farmer didn't keep his sheep here, I would have some myself just for the pleasure they give me. And you know, 
There is something biblical about sheep. You don't hear of horses and cows in the Bible in the same way. You hear of sheep and shepherds. actually met Picasso at some point. What was that meeting like? Picasso has had a tremendous influence on my, on, on the, uh, my period in, in art. He's been the greatest um, figure um, of all in, in my lifetime. Other ones have been very good and so on. I mean, I've lived the same time as uh, um, Brancusi, whom I knew. And he's a, a great artist. Um, Ruo is a, um, is a great artist, or was, yeah. And so on. Oh, yeah. Was your actual meeting with Picasso a pleasant experience? Oh, well, it was an, a, an experience and an excitement because I'd admired him for so long that um, to meet him makes its reality. I think everybody, if, if they could meet, Somebody it should, it should teach them a bit more about that person than what they knew before. <laughs> Henry Moore has said, You know, Picasso and the British Museum were the only sources that I ever really needed. Picasso realized that you can make poetry out of objects that everyone else had passed over, and that is one of the fundamental inspirations of modern art. The Spanish Civil War that Picasso is protesting in a way leads to the Spanish prisoner of 1939. The Spanish Republican soldier cries out from behind barbed wire. Has man imprisoned himself? Has he gotten himself into a situation which he can no longer control? of the crowd looking at a tied-up object. September 3rd, 1939. The title of a change in the world. The day the Moors are bathing off Shakespeare Cliffs of Dover. Air raid sirens are heard. The bathers alert to the war that will come from across the channel. Searchers in the sea. Once again, Moore's words. The air raids began, and the war, far from being an awful worry, became a real experience. Quite against what I expected, I found myself strangely excited by the bomb buildings, but more still by the unbelievable scenes and life of the underground shelters. This is the world below the ground that Henry Moore sees as he remembers. To begin with, I'd never seen anything like it in my life. People undressing their children on the, the trains going by and on the platforms and so on. This was such a, uh, an unusual thing. So I, I, I was pleased to do the shelter drawings and I was... The, um, uh, eliminated from the army. 
I wasn't called up to, into the army because they thought that shelter drawings had some national uh, value or importance. Henry Moore has written, I went into London two or three days a week to do my shelter drawings. It's curious how all that started. The official shelters were insufficient. People had taken to rolling their blankets up about eight or nine o'clock in the evening, going down into the tube stations and settling on the platforms. The authorities could do nothing about it. Later on, the government began to organize things better. They put in laboratories and coffee bars down there and began building four-tiered bunks for the children. It was like a huge city in the bowels of the earth. When I first saw it, quite by accident, that is, I'd gone into one of them during an air raid, I saw hundreds of Henry Moore reclining figures stretched along the platforms. I was fascinated visually, and I went back again and again. I began filling a notebook with drawings, ideas based on London shelter life. Naturally, I could not draw in the shelter itself. I drew from memory on my return home, but the scenes of the shelter world, static figures asleep, reclining figures, remained vivid in my mind. I felt somehow drawn to it all. Here was something I couldn't help doing. I'd previously refused a commission to do war pictures. I was absorbed in the work for a whole year, and I did nothing else. There'd been air raids in other wars, I know, but the only thing at all like those shelters that I could think of was the hold of a slave ship on its way from Africa to America, full of hundreds and hundreds of people who were having things done to them that they were quite powerless to resist. The shelter drawings, there seemed to be a sense of both uh, terror and tenderness in them. Yes, one day, well, it, it's a, it was life. It was, uh, and life in an intense situation. And when people are frightened, uh, they sometimes behave a bit differently from if, if, if it is normal. Or it's, uh, yeah. And the people down in the shelters, to begin with, but they got used to it too, but the people to begin with, used to feel that they were down there and that these things were going on up, up above. But after doing the... After I began to be too familiar with all the shelter scenes, um, I, I said to Kay Clark, who was a great friend of mine, I'm getting a little bit, um, I think, uh, too familiar and repetitious with the shelter drawings. He said, well, uh, Henry, because he was one of the um, people who employed or paid or chose the war artists. And he said, Henry, why don't you go up to uh, York and do coal mines? Because your father was a coal miner and it's important in the national uh, was it? And so, and I thought, well, that's an idea. I'd never been down a coal mine. And I went up there. But it didn't last as long as the shelter thing because there isn't the same human thing in a, in a coal mine that there was in the shelters. I mean, the shelters had mothers and fathers and children and lovers and all this kind of thing. It was a world. Yes. Whereas a coal mine is only men and, and work. It's in the evening after dark when the black black miner creeps.
seemed to be out of nature. Um, was there something about the mines that had a great... Well, the uh, mines is out of nature. It's not a natural thing for human beings to be down uh, a mile under the earth. <laughs> not, not natural at all. Did the sight of those miners have a special meaning for you as a young well, man? Well, of course they have a meaning to me because my father was a miner. And I lived in a coal mining town, in a coal mining district from my childhood. So it, this, this is it, a bit of my own uh, upbringing. Was it something about the miner that made them different in uh, the... No, but it made me understand them uh, more than what uh, a non-miner's son would have understood them. About the mines, he writes at the time, to record in drawing what I felt and saw was a new and very difficult struggle. There was first the difficulty of seeing forms emerging out of deep darkness, then the problem of conveying the claustrophobic effect of countless wooden pit drops two or three feet apart, receding into blackness and of expressing the gritty, grubby smears of black coal dust on the miners' bodies and faces at the same time as the anatomy underneath. Besides sketching the underground shelters and the miners, Henry Moore will draw the remarkable shapes of Stonehenge. The power of Stonehenge. I mean, you did a, a lot of drawings of Stonehenge. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's very impressive. Well, any large block of stone, natural stone, I find is impressive. Uh, a rough stone in the quarries. I mean, the, uh, uh, I like the look of without doing anything to them. As he wanders about the great ruins, he writes about his sketches. As I drew, I found that what interested me most about Stonehenge was not its history, not its original purpose, whether chronological or religious, or even its architectural arrangement, but its present-day appearance. I was, above all, excited by the monumental power and stoniness of the massive man-work blocks and by the effect of time on them. Some 4,000 years of weathering has produced an extraordinary variety of interesting textures. The rocks provide a subject for sketches and a poet's reflections. The mystery of Stonehenge. What secret here has the hand of man shaped in mist and mold? Darkness and light of mystery builder bold of civilizations untold? Ghosts of the past dance in stone. Shapes and shadows defy time's blasts. Temple or throne, contemplations in stone. Terror or delight in morning light to touch God or man alone. What rocks and blocks can talk of ancient eyes and stars, of wild winds and wounded worlds heard and seen that now seem never to be? The greatness of Stonehenge. 